In this video, we will learn about a very important quantum algorithm known as Grover's algorithm. Grover's algorithm was developed in 1996 by Lov Kumar Grover. He used to work at Bell Labs at that time. It is one of my favorite algorithm and I remember screaming with joy when I learned it for the first time. Let's quickly compare Grover's algorithm with Shor's algorithm. Grover algorithms only provide polynomial speed up as compared to Shor algorithms which provides exponential speed up. However, importantly, Grover's algorithm is optimal and Shor's is not optimal. That means we can never find a better quantum algorithm as compared to Grover to solve the same problem. And no classical algorithm can ever outclass Grover's algorithm. So it is optimal classically as well as in terms of quantum computing. Lastly, Grover's algorithm has widespread applications because in many machine learning problems, we use either Grover's algorithm or its variants. Let's understand the problem which is solved by the Grover's algorithm. We are given a function f that takes n bits as input and produces a single bit output. That means we can say our function output is true and false. Our goal is to find a specific input on which function returns true. That's it. But remember, the function is treated as a black box. So we are not allowed to look inside the function. We just can give a specific input to the function and we can check the corresponding output. Let's understand the problem definition with an example. In this example, my n is equals to 3. That means that the function f can take 8 different possible values because 2 raised to power 3 is equals to 8. The function will able to take 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 and so on. And in this example, we assume that out of those 8 different input values, only one input produce 1. That means true. For all other inputs, the function gives false as output. So let's see how a classical algorithm can solve this problem. To solve this problem on a classical computer, we have to check one by one different inputs of the function. We will check what will be f of 0, 0, 0 and this will be equals to 0. So we next check what will be f 0, 0, 1 that means function with the input 0, 0, 1 and that also gives us 0. So we'll check next what will be function output given input 0, 1, 0 and that gives us 0, a false. So we'll continue with the next input. Now we will check what will be the function output given input 0, 1, 1 and that is equals to true or 1. So we stop there. This approach will give us a running time of theta 2 raised to power n. That means in the worst case we always ha has to check almost all the inputs of the function. Even a randomized algorithm on a classical computer will not do better than 2 raised to power n. In contrast to that, Grover's running time is big O 2 raised to power n square root. It is still exponential. It is a polynomial improvement. However, this is an optimal running time 
that any quantum or classical computer can achieve. We should understand the key idea of Grover's algorithm before diving deep into its mathematics. By understanding the key idea, the mathematics will follow naturally. Let's define a vector cat A. Cat A represents an equal superposition of all the inputs for which the function f yields a true output. To better understand cat A, let's consider an example. In this example, we have eight different inputs. Out of these inputs, only three inputs yield a true output, while the remaining inputs yield false. Each location in cat A corresponds to an input. For example, zeroth location corresponds to input 0, 0, 0. First location corresponds to input 0, 0, 1 and so on. In cat A, we assign 1 to the locations where the corresponding input yields true and 0 to the rest of the locations. Finally, we normalize this vector. That's it. This represents our cat A. Note that if we measure cat A, we will obtain our desired input with equal probability of 1 over 3 because there are three different inputs that gives us true. Remember probabilities are the scares of amplitudes. Now let's define an, another vector cat B. Cat B represents an equal superposition of all the inputs for which the function f yields false. In cat B, we assign 1 to the locations where the corresponding input yields false and 0 to the rest of the locations. Then we normalize this vector. If we measure cat B, we will obtain an input with output is equal to 0 with equal probability of 1 over 5. The vectors cat A and cat B are orthogonal to each other, meaning they have 90 degree angle between them. This can be easily verified by noting that their inner product will always be equal to 0. This holds true because if a given location in one vector is non-zero, then the corresponding location in the other vector must be zero. Let's calculate some of the terms of inner product quickly. We start with the zeroth location, taking the product of one divided by square root of three from the first vector and zero from the second vector. The resulting product is equal to zero. Then we move to the first location multiplying 0 from the first vector with 1 divided by square root of 5 from the second vector. This product is also equal to 0. Similarly, each term in the summation of the inner product will be 0. Thus, our inner product will always be equal to 0. This proves that the vectors cat A and cat B will be orthogonal. Let's consider another vector cat h. Cat h is an equal superposition of all the inputs no matter what is their outputs. We can create cat h using Hadamard gates. Assume the angle between cat h and cat b is theta. Now we create a register x and initialize that register with cat h. Note that if we measure our register x right now, we will obtain any input because all the inputs 
have same probability and equal chances of being measured. Therefore, our goal is to move register X closer to cat A. To achieve this, we first reflect X over cat B. Imagine placing a mirror on cat B and create the reflection of register X in that mirror. This reflection will be in the opposite direction, but at the same angle with cat P. The reflected X becomes our new X. Now we reflect X over cat H. Once again, the reflection will be in the opposite direction, but at the same angle. As the angle between register X and cat H is 2 theta, hence cat H will make a 2 theta angle with X reflection, which means it will make a 3 theta angle with cat P. These two reflections have moved register X towards cat A by an angle of 2 theta. May I say this again to emphasize, these reflections will always move X towards cat A by an angle of 2 theta. If we measure this new register X, we will obtain an input that yields true with a higher probability. However, we want the probability to be higher than 99%. Therefore, we repeat these two reflections again and again. These two reflections refer to as Grover rotations. Now, I can explain Grover's algorithm to you. Grover's algorithm is straightforward and consists of only three steps. In step one, we create an equal superposition in cat H by using Hadamard gates. We store a copy of this equal superposition in the register X. In step two, we run a loop, a total of pi by four times the square root of capital N. You might be wondering why the loop runs that many times. Don't worry, I will explain it soon. In this loop, we perform Grover rotations to make X very close to cat A. Finally, in the last step, we measure our register X to obtain an input with a very high probability, maybe more than 99%. We can easily calculate the running time of Grover's algorithm. The running time of Grover's algorithm is theta k root of capital N. Although Grover's algorithm running time is exponential, it is optimal and no quantum or classical algorithm can do better than that. We are far from done. We still have to find answers to the following questions. Number one, why do we perform pi over four times the square root of capital N Grover rotations? Why not more than that or less than that? Number two, how can we perform Grover rotations without knowing cat A and cat B? Because if we know cat A, we can just make register X equals to cat A and get our answer by measuring it. But we don't know cat A and cat B and still we are able to perform Grover rotations. How? Number three, how can we construct the circuit for the Grover's algorithm? Number four, how to calculate probabilities of Grover's algorithm success? I mean, we are saying that we want to find answer with 99% probability, but how can we show that our probability is indeed 99%? Number five, basically we want to present Grover's algorithm using a working example by doing all the calculation by hand. I promise to cover these topics in the next video. It is because, unfortunately, this video is becoming too long for my resource-constrained computer. I hope 
you have enjoyed this video and will stay with me. See you around.